presentation is how to stop the empire while keeping your day job. The DC version for Bernie. My name is Jerry. Today. People like me joined up with the Occupy movement five years ago because we were tired of economic inequality. We wanted to stop the wars and slash the Pentagon's budget. And most of all, we wanted to see the bankers do a perp walk for wrecking the economy, for wrecking the economy, destroying their pensions, and ruining the values of our homes. And of course, Occupy was immediately jumped on and beaten up and everybody who participated in it was facing pepper spray or batons. So, what happened then, I'm sure it happened to all of you, is all of my good, well-meaning, bedwetting liberal friends came to me and they said, oh, don't protest, work within the system, run candidates. Hope and change, hope and change, hope and change. And so, now that we've gone down that road five years, we have even worse economic inequality than we ever had. It looks like Obama's about to start a war in Syria with Russia, never mind spending a trillion dollars on new nuclear weapons. And as for, and as for the banksters, uh, the statute of limitations has run out. We don't even charge them for the things they're doing now. See, the problem... Oh, I'm sorry. Should I mention Bernie? Let me mention Bernie. Yeah! So Bernie was offering everybody a free college education. Well, everybody who worked for him sure got a free education the last six months, didn't we? Yeah! So the problem is with my well-meaning bedwetting liberal friends is that they have not accepted an inconvenient truth. It's too ugly for even Al Gore to bring up. And that is that we no longer live in a democracy. We live in an empire. Empires do whatever they want to do regardless of the will of the people. If you want to stop something the empire is doing, you can't just get all granular on them. You can't just remove that one item. You have to take down the empire. Yeah. And, taking down an, and taking down an empire is not a sprint. It is a marathon. You will need to train. You will need to eat. You will need to find a way to live indoors. In short, you're going to have to figure out a way to keep a day job. And as most of my friends know these days, it's very hard to keep a day job. I'm going to try to address that. So one thing that's changed in the five years since I first did this play, I no longer have a day job. People say, what, Jerry, you lost your day job? I didn't friggin' lose my day job. I know exactly where it is. It's in Mumbai, India. It's being done by Rajneesh. Ranjish is 26 years old, has a winning smile, he's very friendly on the phone, he likes long walks on the beach at sunset, and his favorite color is blue. Okay, I lied, his favorite color is yellow. The point is that Rajesh got my job not because he's smarter than me, or better than me, or younger than me, he got my job because he does it at $2 an hour. And that is one of the things we are facing that the plutocracy will not deal with. So I wanted to let you know all that going in. Now, if you want to know a little about me, I became an activist back when I was a teenager when I found a book, a picture book, actually, of the Hibakusha. Who knows who they were? The Hibakusha were the victims of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who'd had horrible, disfiguring burns all over their bodies and faces. And there were no cures for them. Now, the thing that horrified me about the Hibakusha was not those pictures. The thing that horrified me about the Hibakusha was the fact that somebody in my government was sitting over there looking at those pictures and saying, that's really cool. I wonder if I can do that to a million people at a time. And that's how I became an anti-nuclear activist and an anti-war activist and an anti-every-other kind of thing activist that you can imagine. And in 1982, thank you. In 
And in 1982, I helped plan the largest demonstration ever held against nuclear weapons. Ten million people marched worldwide to stop nuclear war. Don't applaud, we still have nuclear weapons. So then people will sometimes get around to the idea of asking me, well, Jerry, um, <clears throat> tell us about your arrest. Let me tell you about my big arrest. It was during the 80s when Ronald Reagan was in charge. Yeah, yeah, everybody can go, ooh. It was in the 80s when Ronald Reagan was in charge and he was building Star Wars. The headquarters for Star Wars is in Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Vandenberg Air Force Base has more potential death and human misery per square inch than any place else on Earth. They're developing the Navstar satellites, which before they were driving you home to various places you couldn't find on a map, are the targeting system for all our nuclear weapons. They can put nuclear weapons within a meter of their targets anywhere on Earth. They were also at Vandenberg Air Force Base stockpiling hundreds of nuclear weapons in case we needed them. Vandenberg Air Force is the home of the battle star systems we're developing to fight wars in outer space. And Vandenberg is also the home of anti-crowd control weapons, non-lethal crowd control weapons they're called. Did anybody ever experience these? Okay. Let me tell you something about Vandenberg's anti-crowd control weapons. If you're facing them, please bring extra underwear, okay? So there I was at Vandenberg Air Force Base facing the weapons of death and destruction and dookie. And Vandenberg, you see, has a big sign on the front lawn and it says, Vandenberg Air Force Base, peace is our profession. <laughs> Uh, you got 200 nuclear weapons in your basement. I don't know what your profession is. Peace wouldn't be my first guess, okay? So there I was, and I got a little ticked off about this sign, and one thing led to another, and I found some paint. And one morning when all those Air Force kids came driving into their jobs at Vandenberg Air Force Base, the sign now read, Vandenberg Air Force Base, peace is our profession, war is just our hobby. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was funny, too. My prosecutor did not. <laughs> See, under normal circumstances, that would just be a vandalism disorderly conduct charge, but it happened on federal property. So they decided to charge me with the high crime of interfering with the defense of the United States, which carries a five-year prison sentence. Now, I didn't go to prison like that, but I had a probation that was five years long, and my probation said that I could not associate with other protesters, and I could not myself protest. So I had to rearrange my whole life. I had to sort of start from scratch. I had to find a day job. And I found a day job, and until very recently, I was doing it well. So I would do what I can. But all the things I was protesting against all those years ago, they're still true. I mean, Leonard Peltier is still in jail. We're still fighting a drug war and throwing people in prison. Uh, we're still bombing the crap out of poor people all over the planet. And then the Occupy movement came along, and you knew the Occupy movement was being targeted when you saw everything go down about it. Uh, people accused me of being a conspiracy theorist because I said that Obama had signed the NDAA Military Detention Act, which allows them to detain people without trial. He had signed it because of the Occupy Wall Street movement. People called me a conspiracy theorist. And my answer was, if you don't think there was a connection, you are a coincidence theorist. <laughs> and now all these things are coming true. And we had what we just saw, an illegal and broken election. And all my friends who wouldn't admit it at the time know that I was right. And now they're coming up to me and they're saying, well, Jerry, now what should we do? like I'm supposed to know. Look, folks, what I know is what does not work. Painting cute signs does not work. Marching in large groups around empty buildings does not work. Uh, let's see, what else doesn't work? Uh, writing, writing really passionate letters to your Congress creature 
That does not work unless you can sign them David Koch. And if you can sign the letter David Koch, you don't have to send him a friggin' letter. You've got him on speed dial and he has to pick up after two rings. And I know what the purpose of this rally is, but for the most part, voting doesn't work. I've been voting since Jerry Ford was in office. I've never had a chance to vote on a war. I've never had a chance to vote to feed kids more food. I've never had a chance to vote to get Leonard Peltier out. So I know a lot of things that don't work, but I've been dealing with activists all my life, and some of them have some ideas on things that just might work. The way things are going right now, we're going to need every weapon in the arsenal we can find. So without further ado, uh, take some notes. First and foremost thing, if you want to stop the empire, stop working so damn hard. Yeah! yeah. Really, stop working so hard. Remember, after 2008 and the Lehman crash, all of the increases in the economy of the United States went to the 1%. So working harder is not getting you any more money. You are also not getting any more money because you're paying the taxes. It isn't Romney, it sure as hell isn't Trump. You're the one who's going to be paying the taxes to keep the war machine going. So as much as possible, if you can, don't work so hard. Now, I want to say you're off the hook if you're working in an emergency room when I show up. Okay. There are certain kinds of jobs where you could kind of care. But for the most part, we all have to start pushing back. I know most people in their offices, they're doing more work than they've ever done before. Everybody's picking up a couple extra hours a week. If you got 10 people in your office, and everybody's working an extra two, three hours a week, that's another hire they could do. So maybe you have to, like, what's that word? Uh, organize. Yeah, you have to organize and get your fellow employees to push back. Now, I'm not telling you to be slackers, but you're going to need to carve out some extra time in your day from now on because you're going to need some planning time to figure out how to take down an empire. Okay, step two. Step two. Stop buying crap you don't need. Thank you very much. That includes this. I'm horrible at this. I buy things all the time that I do not need. But we keep getting our wants and our needs confused. Let's face it. Uh, food and rent are necessities. And unfortunately, until we can find somebody reasonable to run, so is some student debt anyway. But there's a lot of things we pay money for I mean, do we really need the iPhone 9 that's going to run holographic uh, Angry Birds? And by the way, I've been, I've been a troublemaker for 25 years. Uh, there was a time when you couldn't be a troublemaker and wear Nikes because they were made in China. So what the hell happened to all of us that were buying iPhones and iPads and iPods and they're all made by iSlaves, huh? Stop confusing the things you buy with a person you want to be. Maybe if we didn't buy crap we didn't need, we wouldn't have to work quite so hard. Okay, uh, what number am I up to? Uh, three. Okay, three. Okay, now things... <sighs> Take the money you're saving in step two and help the people who've already been fighting the good fight. You know who I'm talking about. Uh, Chelsea Manning could sure use a check right yeah! now. Yeah! So could Jeremy Hammond, so could Barrett Browning, so could Julian Assange. All of those people are doing what I hope I would do if I had the information in front of me, and they did it. So we've got to pull together and make sure that they know they're not forgotten. Okay, yeah. so that's, uh, what was it, three? Okay. Now we get a little more complicated. This is number four. I got to give you a little history. When me and 10 million of my closest personal friends marched against nuclear weapons, somebody asked Al Haig. Who knows Al Haig? Oh, yeah. hey. Al Haig was uh, Reagan's chief of staff. Somebody asked Al Haig what he thought of all those protesters out in front of his building, and he said, They can protest all they want as long as they keep paying taxes. Okay, I can't drop the mic, but you know what I'm thinking. 
The reality is that they don't care what we say, they care what we do, and the most important thing we do is keep the empire going by contributing to their voluntary tax system. I'll tell you how voluntary it is. Think of what would happen for just one moment. There's 300 million of us, there's less than 100,000 IRS agents. What happens if everybody starts signing their tax return, Dick Hurts? And there's a moral thing here, I'm trying to be practical, but as my friends in the Christian peace community keep reminding me, if you are living in the empire's comforts, you're paying your taxes, you're behaving yourself, you're not getting arrested, you're not causing trouble, then you own Abu Ghraib. Yeah. You own the drone strikes. You own whatever nuclear weapons were about to blow up over Syria. Now, I realize that's a huge step to take, and again, I'm trying to keep everybody employed. So there are other ways to get around this. You don't have to be the one to stop paying your taxes. If you're in a community, somebody has made the moral decision to do that, you have to support them. And if you can't even do that, there's one other thought I have. Every year the IRS lets everybody take a little extra time to fill out their tax. You can automatically get an extension. The Treasury Department hates this because they want to close the books. So here's my thought. What if 20 million of us next April 15th said to the IRS, the dog ate my homework, see you in August? Yeah. I'm just saying now, this, this doesn't want to be sedition. Okay, and now we are up to... Uh, Five. No, this is four and a half. Four and a half. Stop giving the government extra money. You're all adults, you all look really smart. You're not going to win the lottery. And if the money for the lottery was actually going for education, people would be too friggin' smart to buy lottery tickets, right? And then, uh, I hate to pick on you, but then there's cigarettes. Besides being an excellent way to kill yourself, it's a great way to take extra tax money out of your hide. And by the way, this gets back to number two. You are not a rebel because you smoke American spirit cigarettes. And you are not a rebel if you take the bonus money you make from working for one of the creepy banks and buy yourself a Harley Davidson. You're a poser. People who buy things they don't need and can't afford to impress people they don't even like are the way the empire subverts your desire to rebel, which is completely justified. Uh, I don't want to be a fashion advisor here because I look like I staggered into a Salvation Army at night with my eyes closed. The woman in front says, Salvation Army rocks. Let's give her an amen. Thank you. But you are not a rebel because of what you wear. You are a rebel because you're standing up to a government that is engaged in imperial excess. Let's see. Now, it's, it's okay there. Okay, so five. Turn off your Twitter machines, stop goofing the goofballs, don't go to Google anymore. Turn the machine off, go out your door and meet your neighbors. Your neighbors are at least as pissed off as you are, and probably nobody's talking to them about this stuff. And you need to meet your neighbors anyway, because if things are going bad, your neighbors are going to be your salvation. You need to learn some helpful, useful hints on what your neighbors need. And by learning skills, I don't mean you're learning web coding or financial analysis. You're learning how to hammer a nail. You're learning how to make food out of what you've rescued from a dumpster, maybe for a large group of people. And being a good neighbor also means it isn't enough if you get through the police lines at your apartment hassle-free if your neighbor's kid is getting stopped and frisked. The thing we all have to do is, well, at least I have to do, is give away that white privilege that keeps think, making us think that we're immune to this. Yeah. Yeah. Number six on the same subject. Do not give hard, poor people a hard time. Do not make fun of poor people. There are plenty of poor people in this world. And I tell everybody, if you get on a subway and you look around, you have more in common with anybody on that train than you ever will with the billionaire class. The thing we all have to remember is that every time an activist makes fun of a poor person, both Koch brothers pop a Woody, okay? 
Number seven. What? Sometimes they don't. Most of the time they don't. But we have a whole society here that's built around making fun of poor people. Not activists, but I'm saying, I'm saying, if you want to get ahead in this world, we have to be the defenders. We good? Okay. When we get home, when we get finished, we can have a conversation. I'll tell you how to write your own play. So anyway, uh, let's see, that was... Uh, all right, the next one we're going to do. I know everybody who has an actual mailing address gets annoyed about this. When you open the mailbox and you've been invited to do jury duty, occupy juries. The reality is the empire's, the empire's whole uh, legitimacy is tied up with the fact that it looks like they're handing out justice in an even-handed way. So we all know, of course, that they don't want to tell you that you have the right as a act of conscience to vote not guilty. Always. Jury nullification. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see. What else? Um, I should tell you that when I was in Europe after my little fracas with uh, the feds, I was told by activists there that nobody goes to jail for the kind of charges I go to. I went to jail for, and the reason is juries will not vote with the military establishment. Juries will not vote with the empire. So we have to also educate juries. And the last thing, Mr. Marijuana, that I would like to say, Mr. Cannabis, thank you, thank you. So anyway, what I want to say here is if you want to really legalize this stuff, make sure that nobody can ever get convicted for any crime involving marijuana. And once people know that, and every defendant says, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for a jury trial, the whole system breaks down. Okay, now I've gotten to step eight. And step eight's the really hard one. Uh, step eight is when I stop being really enjoyably snarky and I start to get dark. <laughs> Step eight is speaking truth to power. You're going to be Toto in the Wizard of Oz pulling the curtain away from an evil, evil liar. And they hate that. I'm telling you to try to keep your day jobs in the current society we have. I don't know how you can stay out of prison and keep a day job, let alone keep a day job if you're speaking truth to power. We all saw what happened to Occupy Wall Street. We all saw what's happened to Bernie, which didn't go to prison exactly, but he didn't be president either. And the fact is that things are getting worse, and we're the people who know how to solve that. The fact is that, as the Indian poet said, Civilization is only three meals deep, and things are looking very bad for us right now if we don't make some changes. At the same time, I know as an activist, you're going to lose friends. You're going to have people who don't want to speak to you. Your family's going to think you're idiots. Sometimes the only person you'll be able to get affirmation from is the person who you see in the mirror every day. And so I'm going to speak to a spiritual side of you that if you believe that Martin Luther King was right when he said the arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice. And if you believe that we have an obligation to each other to call out evil, to call out liars and bullies, then you're going to have to find some way to speak truth to power. Okay, happier note. You're going to come to demonstrations like this and you're going to march your ass off. Now I know I told you that demonstrations do not change the empire and that's absolutely true. You do not bring down the empire by coming to demonstrations. That's not why you come to demonstrations. You come to demonstrations because after spending two or three years of listening to your yay who asshole friends say all lives matter, it's nice to be surrounded by people who agree with you, isn't it? And maybe at that demonstration, you're going to meet people who think the same way you do, and you're going to get on the bus with them, and you're going to figure out ways to stop the empire that I haven't even figured out. So, last, and I'm, I'm trying to wind this up. I'm sure I'm over time. God bless you all.
So, last step, learn to have fun. No empire has ever lasted forever. You need to keep that in mind when you're wearing plastic cuffs and they're throwing tear gas at you. You are going to need to maintain a sense of humor if you're going to get through the next few years. Because, like I said at the beginning, taking down an empire is not a sprint, it is a marathon, and we all know not everybody finishes a marathon. So that's most of what I have to say. Uh, if you want to check out what I do, um, I'm working on a, well, no. I do uh, weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, any kind of covered dish event. I need, I need pizza and decent beer. Don't bring that Michelob crap. And in the meantime, uh, my book, uh, The Tubby Balding Anarchist Guide to Diet, Exercise, and Revolution Joe. It's going to be on Amazon as soon as I write it. And in the meantime, keep doing this. Remember, we have November 9th. Maybe that'll turn out a different way. When the revolution comes, uh, I'm going to be in New York. We'll all meet at Zuccotti. Bring beer. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dan Pinch. Now we know how to keep our day jobs, if we have them. All right, so next we're going to have Tim Black. You guys have heard of, right?